Welcome to Strange Weekly News. In this show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Welcome to all of my first-time viewers and listeners, and all of those watching this live. Bill, Zoltan, Chris, Kurt, Jonaside, Daniel, Sever, welcome everyone that is here. Before we get started, I would like to mention that on Tuesday, on Top 5, we had one of the pioneers of paranormal podcasting, Jim Harold, and we covered the Top 5 Campfire Mysteries. Then yesterday, Thursday, on Mysteries with the History with Jimmy Church from Fade to Black Radio, we covered the Mysteries of Britain Part 2 and going deep into the Holy Grail. So last week we did a Starbucks gift card giveaway and Earth Spirit received a $47 Amazon gift card. We started off at $10, that was the base price, and then people were donating to the gift card, and then we had one person walk away with the prize. So if you would like to make someone's day, you can add to the gift card with the super chats and super sticker. Just make sure to write for the gift card, and I will tally that up. We will do the drawing at the very end of the show where the winner will decide if they would like a Starbucks or an Amazon gift card. Now, to enter, listen, listen closely to enter in the live chat you have to put hmm what would be a good name for today well let me bring in my two co-hosts and maybe they can give me a cool name to uh, or, or a cool word to put in the live chat for people to get in and entered into the drawing jimmy micah what's the first thing that comes to mind alien Alien? Okay, well that's that's gonna be that's gonna be it for today. So in the live chat, just write alien. Like that's it. Just uh no hashtag, nothing like that. It doesn't need to be in caps. And uh, we already have two entries right now, and we'll do that drawing at the very end of the show. So just put in alien in the live chat. Jimmy, thank you so much. I I appreciate that. And uh, Cassidy as well. Thank you guys so much. Um, Jimmy, is that for the gift card or is that just for me? You're still on mute. I'm yeah, messing with you. I'm, I'm mess with I was watching. I See, know. To go live. Go live. I'm getting that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's uh for the gift card. And, nice. So we're and, already at sixty dollars right there. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Like very cool. Down. You know, Micah's going to match in just a second. And uh, and that's really cool. Well, let's get into today. There's a lot of interesting articles for us to cover. because This is Weekly Strange News. So we cover everything weird and mysterious. Is it okay and if I say hello to everybody first? You definitely or can. Jump into the deep end of the pool. Right. Jump head it, first, though. Well, everybody, how you doing? It's Friday. I am so glad to be here. You haven't seen Christina and I in ages uh, together. Um, and so it's just so good to finally be back with everyone. Uh, Christina, Micah, it's good to see you. Always a pleasure, sir. <laughs> what is what is what is this? Oh, OK. All right. All right. Oh, Sever, thank you so much for the yeah. RV fund. I do uh, really, really appreciate that. Thank the you. RV fund. I thought he was. I, was, I thought he was going large for the gift. Large card. and in charge. But thank you so much. So right now we're looking at sixty. We got twenty three entries. To put in alien in the live chat if and only if you're watching this live. Micah, before we get started, uh, Jimmy already said hi. Do you want to say hi to everyone as well? Well, of course, I always want to say hi, and I also want to wish everybody out there a happy St. Patrick's Day, one of my very favorite holidays of the year. Uh, I'm just is glad that, uh, that the the gig that my band and I have this evening uh, is going to be late enough, in fact, entirely too late, and so that allows me to be here right now, and I'm glad to be here. No better place to be, in fact, on such a wonderful holiday. Yeah. Are, did you start drinking this morning, Micah? Coffee, yes. Oh, now, I won't say whether there is Irish whiskey or if there is Irish cream in the coffee, I'll have to leave that up to inquiring minds out there who wish they knew. Yeah, well played, well played. I, I used to always wonder, <clears throat> this is a news story, you know, it's St. Patty's Day. 
you know, so I would be driving to work on St. Patty's Day. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, and listening to talk radio. And and they would say things like, okay, we're going live to Debbie's Irish Pub in Santa Monica, where our reporters have started drinking already. And, they're you know, they come live on the air. Woohoo! This is our third bar. We've been drinking. I was like, how do you, how do you, how do you do that? And then, but the bar is full of people drinking at eight o'clock in the morning. And I just, I, uh, I've never done that. And I've often, maybe, you know, that's a bucket list thing. Micah, you and I, St. Patty's Day, one of these days in the future, we should hit, you know, hit some pubs at 8 a.m. If I were going to hit a pub at 8 a.m., yeah, something like that. Yeah, almost like puddle jumping, except, uh, well, you know, you don't splash in the water. You just hope that you don't spill it on the floor. But yes, if ever, Jimmy, I did that with anybody at 8 a.m. on St. Patty's Day, it would, of course, be you, my friend. All right. All right. So invitation accepted. Um, So this this tallies automatically, Christina? That's correct. So you just put in alien as you see it exactly on the screen. And you put it in the live chat, if and only if you're watching this live, it tallies all of them up. So far, we have 36 entries. Man, she has got technology, Micah. StreamYard is your best friend. Man, man, she's got tech. Okay, Uh, Christina, this is your show. We're doing the news this week. We've got lots of great things to uh, cover. Uh, Where uh, where are we going to start today? Well, I want to start off with a video that I have for you guys to watch and everyone watching this on YouTube. If you are listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube because we will be sharing a lot of pictures and videos as well. But this one, right now, Tom DeLonge is a controversial figure. He was really, really popular a few years back with To The Stars Academy, and he kind of died out slowly. But just recently on his Instagram, March 4th, he posted a video with really no context other than stating that there was a UFO sighting in Texas. I have the video here. I'm going to go ahead and share that. Um, I took off the uh, audio, but take a look at this. And I read the comments on Instagram. It also got posted on Reddit a little earlier this week. And there's there's a lot of conflicting ideas. Some think that it's definitely man-made, but then you see this fast zoom and you're like, what's going on? Some think it's Photoshop, CGI, which is a total valid explanation, but no one has the answers. And Tom DeLong gave, once again, no context whatsoever. Uh, okay, I'm going first. All right, let's hear it. Micah, Micah thinks this is real. That is just a load of crap. <laughs> That's, that, that reminds me, I like Tom. All right, but that, uh, just stop, stop. I'd rather have him put up his Fender Starcaster guitar and have that flash away and, and ask for comments. But that, no, no, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not taking the, uh, I'm not taking the TD bait on this one. (laughs) Micah. Well, I'll I'll add to that, Jimmy. Uh, I like Tom DeLonge too. I was a fan of Blink-182. You know, my brother, Caleb was a huge fan of Blink-182 back when we were in high school. And he even worked for Tom for a while as an artist before Lou and Chris and the guys joined, and then they really kind of did change the narrative for a time involving UAP. But Tom also does have a bit of a history of posting questionable videos and referring to them as possible evidence. There's the TR3B video of the alleged triangle that obviously is CGI. The, the so one he did, uh, you talk, uh, I'm going to jump in, Micah, uh, and then continue. The one that he showed on Joe Rogan. Yeah, and again, yeah, right. exactly. And, and it, uh, the, the thing is, is I, I just – would love to see some really good UFO footage. I actually have seen some good UFO footage. I've seen good UFO photographs, but this is the issue. And it's really a fundamental kind of philosophical problem and a scientific one that we face in the UFO community. How good a good UFO photo can be before it actually constitutes convincing evidence in support of the phenomena. Now, some like Mick West would say, look, there are very few good photos and videos and even the best photo or video He and other skeptics naturally are going to try and debunk it. And even the footage that's been obtained with very sensitive and very capable military equipment like the Atflare targeting pod in use by the Navy with, uh, you know, Raytheon technology, that's not good enough to meet the criteria that skeptics would deem to be good evidence. So 
for me, we have to have really good photos, really good video, but also recognize that's probably not going to satisfy a lot of scientists out there. That video to me, however, is not an example of what I'd call a good UFO video. Sorry. No, it's not even a good fake UFO video. No, it's not. No. It's not. It's not even a good fake one. It's uh, if you're going to, if you know, I mean, look, that was probably um, and I'm just throwing this out there. That was probably done and edited all on a cell phone. Right. That wasn't anything that was laid out in After Effects and somebody spent a great amount of time on it because it's just crap. So, um, you know, and the the ease of doing that today is right there for everybody. And so, you know, but no, that's that's just that's just crap. That's just it's it's a bad fake video. I've seen pretty good. I've seen pretty good fake ones where I went, yeah, man, good, good job. Good effort. <laughs> right. One of the best, ones, one of the best ones was, do you, do you remember the one a few years ago, Jimmy, from uh, Israel, which showed yeah, the object. The, yeah. The yeah. Jerusalem ones. Yeah. And, and, and th those were all hoaxed and faked. And actually that wasn't a few years ago. Art Bell back in, I'm going to go 2009. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah, so most of those, yeah, 2009. So, uh, you know, those are 13, 14 years old, and they did it from so the hoax was from three different perspectives, three different positions. Yeah. They had the crowds there and everything. And I gotta tell you, the first time I saw it, which was you know, on my cell phone, I was like, uh, okay, maybe. Pretty good. Yeah, maybe pretty good. And it was the perspectives, you know, the different views. Um, okay. All right. I'll tell you another good one. Then we'll move on. Christina's waiting for us because we're, we're spending time on a hoax. It's a stupid fake video, but, um, there was, again, I'm going to go back 15 years. There was a, a video that was posted on YouTube of this a giant craft flying over these palm trees over a freeway. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, allegedly shot in Santa Clarita, California, right? So that's down the street from my house. And, and I looked at, now, you know what? Obviously fake, but damn good. And then I went, I mean, it was really, really good. And then I went and uh, watched the effects artist who was uh, 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 a working uh, effects artist here in, in Hollywood, uh, you know, very talent. And he went through the whole thing on how, he, you know, how you do this, how you layer it, how you skin it, how you get the motion graphics and, and how much time he spent on it. And that was a lot of fun. And then I went back and I, I started to appreciate that video more and more. It was just really, really, really well done. And, uh, but, but this video isn't that. And, and so there you go. Okay. Christina, what's next? Well, to to comment on that, I, the most sketchy thing about the video was there were no witness names, no exact location other than Texas, the time of day, the date, all of these different things that we would expect in a recorded sighting we didn't receive. And so while we we do think it's a hoax. I think it's still really important to share with the audience and to show that if someone's going to show you a video or if you find one online, there's certain pieces of information that you need to make it a little bit more credible than just seeing the footage without anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if it comes from, quote, decently credible people, which, as we know, Tom is, is kind of on the fence uh, <laughs> at this point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but that's a really good point. The last video that I posted that I took, Mick West uh, debunked it and took it completely apart. I loved uh, his work on that. But I posted, when I posted that video, I posted the day, date, time, location, time stamped. Everything was there, the 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 direction I was facing. And so, and then Nick turned around. That's what you do, Christina, right? Exactly what you're saying. Everything there. So if, if, if somebody was in the general location on that day, they could come in and say, I was there. I saw it. Um, I also have pictures. Thank you for, so you have that opportunity for everybody else out there. What Mick West did 
And I was so thankful that he did because I saw like in five or six, maybe eight, no, it was more than that. But in this particular video, right in a row, these objects lighting up, flying across the sky, getting bright and then disappearing on the horizon um, at about, I, I can't remember, it was around midnight or something or one in the morning. And, uh, but it was, it blew my mind. So I posted the video, Nick contacted me. I said, okay, uh, I've got everything general in the description of the video, but here's the additional information that you've asked for. And I gave him everything the best that I could to the second of, uh, the time of, of, of day on that particular night. And it was Starlink. Right. Okay. So, and he was able to break it down every single Starlink satellite, its position in the sky, but that's what you do. You know, just provide everybody the information. You may be a fan of McWest or not. Uh, that's not the point. There are very, very, very smart people out there that can turn around. Mick West isn't the only one that can analyze the video and, and take a look at it. Not only the, the the possibility of being a satellite, but breaking it down and looking at the illumination, the colors, the background, and 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 distance and location and speed, uh, people have the ability to do that. They're they're really really smart, far beyond what I am capable of, and that's what you should do. You just don't post a random video like that with no information behind it, and 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 just expect people to to buy into it. So there you go. Okay, all right. All right. I, I got to add something to it. I'll be brief. I'll be brief. Look, a lot of people look at Mick West and they say, you know, he's a skeptic and it's us versus them. No, 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 no. To serious UFO researchers, Mick West is a friend. And like you said, Jimmy, I appreciate what he does. I think it's very important what he lends to this. You know, he was out there at Alien Con. He was meeting people and he was interacting with people. He engages with this community and he, he tries to do so in a meaningful way. I don't always agree with all of his conclusions, but I do correspond with Mick like you do. You know, and I think his contributions are very valuable and I appreciate that. Sorry, Christina, go yeah, ahead. I do, too. I do too. I do too. Okay, Mick, you just got... Uh, 15 shout outs uh, today. So there you go. <laughs> Mick West. He does great work, man. He does great work. I don't agree with all of it. I, I, I don't agree with just about any. I certainly don't agree with Micah Hanks on anything. And, yeah, and that's how you on. learn. That's how you learn. You have a spirited discussion and, 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 and go through things. That's it. That's it. You know, I, everybody knows I agree with everything that Micah Hanks says. Oh, yeah. I don't agree with you, kid. And is your name Christina? I said Christina, not Jimmy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. Micah, Micah brings up a really good point. It's not us versus them. We need those skeptics or even right. debunkers as well because right. they're going to see details that other people don't because they're in that mindset. They're in that mentality to look for all of the flaws. Now, if you are already believing the video, you're going to be a lot more lenient on it. Be like, well, everything looks fine. It must be real. But, but what both of you have said it's very important to note it's not us versus them, but at the same time with the information that they provide and they say, no, it's not that they should also state it's not this because I think it's also very important to give that because reason. Absolutely. You know, um, if you're surrounded by, um, okay, well, let's talk about Mick for a second. Or, um, uh, you know, the opposite of Mick, Jeremy Corbell, right? So we got the two opposites. And if you're surrounded, you know, I'm just, so I'm not talking about one specific person here, but if you're surrounded by yes people that aren't going to challenge you, then you're, you're, you're never in check. You're never in check mode. You know, you need to check yourself. You need to center yourself. You need to be able to and and and, and talk about going back to square one once in a while. Sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you just got to back up, replant your feet, and then move back forward again. And it's okay to do that. And you're never going to do that if you're surrounded by people that think that everything that you do is is 100% correct. No. You also have to be very courageous to question yourself as well. It takes a lot of 
courage because you can very easily lie to yourself and to everyone else saying, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely right. And I'm right because I say so. But when you take that step back and you think, but am I right? Or even playing with yourself, the devil's advocate, those are the people that you want to speak to. It's those people that have gained that credibility more so than others that just have this level of confidence and that's it. Yeah, yeah. You, If you're an actor, you're an actor and you're surrounded by people going, you know, hey, so how was that? Was I good today? You were awesome, dude. Right? <laughs> no, no, you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow. And, and that's it. Let's 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 uh, let's cover something fun. OK, well, Jimmy, I'll let you pick the next article then. Can we do uh, uh, the other video? Can we do the ghost video? Uh, this one is a very interesting. I'm going to share my screen. Have here. you seen this? Have you seen this, Micah? Well, of course, I received the show notes earlier today via email. So I have been made privy to all of the stories we're going to be covering this evening. Isn't okay. that wonderful? All right. Fantastic. All right. All right let's let's share this. Micah, give us the rundown on this video. So, uh, of course, another unconfirmed piece of footage that displays. I thought Jimmy was the one that picked this story. Though. How come I'm giving the rundown on this? But because you're supposed he to be picked, here. so you're doing the rundown. Okay, fascinating. So, anyway, you're supposed to be watching here in a moment. You're going to see a possible ghost enter the frame, or at least what one man likened to being a possible ghost. Uh, of course, this a video like this raises questions, for one. Like right, instance, there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. up? Yeah, back. can you back it up? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to play a few times, and then I'll just go back to you. Okay, sure. Okay. All right, so uh, so we're going to have that on loop so people can kind of see. So some sort of object, of course, moves into the frame. Uh, an interesting thing about this is this one also reminds me of a similar video from a few years back. Um, I think that maybe the name uh, given to it online is the Georgia Roadrunner. It shows a purported Sasquatch. Okay, some sort of an object enters the frame. And this, there's sort of like a history of this with videos from from your cameras mounted on a dash cam, you know, vehicle going down the road, something unexplained appears. In principle, this should be a really good way to be able to get UFO videos. But I think you saw right there what presumably we're calling the ghost. Now, what exactly is this? I want Church's opinion on what maybe we're seeing in this video. What does that look like to you? It's a ghost wearing white boxers. Ah, I think it's yeah. ghost. I like this ghost. And, and when you when you slow the video down and and freeze frame it. He's kind of hunched over. He's got his arms up like this. Um, he's wearing, uh, I don't know if they're boxer briefs or they're regular boxers. I did yeah. try to uh, figure that out because that would be a clue as to timeline. Right. Um, yeah, how analysis. Yeah. yeah, because if they're just regular boxers, he could be from the 1800s, right? But if exactly. they're boxer yeah. briefs, you know, we're talking about the 2000s, right? This is a recent yeah, ghost. Think- a recent death, a recent departing of the soul. But you can see that he's hunched over. Now, what I do like about this video is that we have the mile marker, SR87, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, SR87 near mile marker 200, 2.30 a.m., March 11th, when he passed by this transparent figure. We have the truck driver's name. We have the location. We have the day, date, and time. I love all of that, right? So this just isn't some random uh, video that is is posted. Also, uh, just for the interest of transparency, this was posted by my Uncle Bill. No, yeah. but his name uh, is yeah. William Church. Yeah, which my is Uncle Bill, Bill for short. It's my Uncle Bill. Yeah, it's my Do Uncle we Bill. We all have an Uncle Bill. <laughs> yeah, I have an I Uncle do. Bill no. too. I have an I Uncle don't. Bill. Uncle Bill Church. He's been on Fade to Black. He's a, a black helicopter pilot in the army for reals you know he came on my show he came on my show and this is how he debunked black helicopters then we'll get back to this ghost he goes of course we have black helicopters he goes but there's tail numbers they're just painted in black they're all there jimmy and i said really he goes yeah man i fly black helicopters all the time (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, well, that, that answers that. It's That's not a myth. That's not urban legend. He said, yeah, there's all kinds of black aircraft, uh, but they all have tail numbers, and the tail numbers are painted in black on the black aircraft. Yeah. Did you know that, Micah? Well, 
No, actually, I didn't. Although I did have a very interesting conversation about black helicopters and the kinds of things that they uh, tend to investigate the other day. Although that was with a source that I can't really discuss right now. Uh, having I to do know. with an unrelated matter. I'll, I'll, tell should, you okay, okay, I'll, I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. Uncle Bill, man, he, he uh, helicopter pilot for some crazy ass stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, Christina, for some crazy stuff uh, for for 40 years. Um, wow. And just recently retired. And he's got so all the stories. Really, so this really is Uncle Bill who mm. who captured this footage. The one and the same. He's somebody's Uncle Bill. Okay, so this is not necessarily no, your Uncle Bill. My Uncle Bill. No, my Uncle Bill is not a truck driver in Texas. <laughs> he's a helicopter pilot in uh, Alabama at uh, at the uh, at the Army. Uh, uh, helicopter flight school. All right. Thank you for clarification on that. As to what yes. we're seeing though, right there, reflective spectral boxer shorts or something else. I don't know. Yeah, Again, go, go, go one. See, I have it. Um, I have this on a really large monitor, Micah, and mm -hmm. looking at it there, it, uh, it looks can, like a reflection, doesn't it's, it? It's more in focus. She's got this in between frames right here. Uh -huh. That's right. Yes. Yeah, so when when you do have the video, you can see it a little bit more crisp than what you're seeing here. I'm yeah. seeing comments that like it looks like a plastic bag from the video. Totally agree with you on that. But if you look at it on your own laptop, your own monitor, you will see those details a little bit better. Oh, he's um, walking. He's walking. His feet. You can see him. He's walking. Well, see, you you his had mentioned. Walking. That it was a guy in boxers, and I had to agree with someone in the live chat that had stated that looks kind of like a child. And I'm trying to find that comment because, like, when I first saw it, I said to myself, "Like, it looks like a really small human." Oh, I, I, I it, it, it didn't strike me that way, but uh, I will say that. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Um, let me see which oh, one do I want here. Okay. XR, I agree with you. I have it. Where is it? Okay. I don't have it up uh, on my big screen anymore. I have to reload it. Keep talking. I'm going to reload it and then I'll be able to, I can share my screen. Yeah. We have the technology. You guys talk. That sounds so wonderful. <laughs> this <laughs> this happened between Phoenix and Payson with no cars in sight, William Church had mentioned, and he described the figure as just standing in the roadway as I passed by looking like uh, where you can see the lines through the legs making the figure. So he was describing that this entity looked somewhat transparent, and while we're seeing it as if it's walking, what Mr. Church saw was just something standing there. And he. what's interesting about SR87 um, is that there has been a fair share of deadly car crashes in that area. And it makes you question, does that play any significance with this sighting? Michael, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, again, we have to remember that scientific tenant Correlation does not necessarily mean causation. Uh, right. Almost any highway anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world for that matter is going to probably have a history of automobile accidents, deaths and things like that. I don't mean to sound like a skeptic. I mean, I'm actually very interested in the possibility that people do see apparitions of the deceased. You know, back in the day, I think it was the uh, um, oh, gosh, was it the British? Uh, I have to remember which of the organizations. But I mean, there was extensive work done toward the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th. Uh, looking into claims of encounters with deceased loved ones, dreams, premonitions, things like this. To me, it's just like UFOs. The abundance of anecdotal evidence does to me suggest that there's something to it. But again, a video that's moving very quickly down a highway that seems to show something that's, I mean, it's a fleeting glimpse of what? That doesn't do it for me. Uh, it doesn't really do it for me with UFOs either. And yet I'm compelled to believe that based on the anecdotal data, right? Which doesn't, again, satisfy a physicist or a chemist. But nonetheless, I think that those narratives, the best of them, if one were true, it would point to the reality of something behind this. I do think that there's some good information suggestive of there being some component that some might, again, call ghostly. But again, to me, does that necessarily point to the afterlife? Does that point to, you know, another dimensional space? 
that overlaps with ours if we want to get kind of out there but keep things more in the realm of like you know physics i don't know what that means time slips things like that those kinds of stories very interesting to me also um and there's some really interesting ones that have been recorded over the years so to me if anything ghosts might be more likely to represent some aspect of physics that we don't fully yet understand rather than being some lingering presence that's representative of a physical person that somehow lingers after they have passed on from this world that we would again ascribing you know maybe a religious or a spiritual interpretation to we might call a soul or something along those lines so trying to separate those narratives traditional beliefs and things like that uh religion uh, and those kinds of things from what Ever the actual phenomena may be and what it represents, that can be difficult at times for humans. I'm human too, but I do find the broader narrative very interesting, whether or not that video to me is a good example necessarily of what we're trying to get to the bottom of. I don't have, yeah, I don't, I don't have issues uh, with the video part of, uh, uh, you know, where we typically, okay, now I've got, I've got a great, okay. Yeah, now I don't think that's a kid. Okay, so let me share this really quick. Um, I had yeah. to, sorry for the delay, but I had to go and uh, find the clean video, but I have it here. Jimmy, and, all good things in life are worth waiting for, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are. Mm -hmm. And so let's back this up again. And okay. yeah, yeah, that's okay. It, it, it just doesn't uh, look. Look, sure. man, I'm out. Now that we get a better a better view, though, man, I'm going to have to say quadruped. I think we're seeing a coyote or maybe a fox, maybe a cat, small dog. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, small dog walking that has two legs and two arms wearing unless a diaper. It's facing, unless it's facing into yeah, the... Uh, into the there's, you can see it. Look at my... Uh, if, there's a frame that pops up uh, right behind the mirror. This is a, a tractor trailer, and that's the mirror on the front of the truck. And like you, you <laughs> can clearly, <laughs> you can clearly see. Okay, now, now let's see. Let's go to the slow motion part. Um, no, and I can't this, clearly see that. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's go, man, Micah. That's it, man. Okay, here we are in slow motion. Now watch this. Okay. Is so much more clear than uh, the one that. Uh, now look, look. He is it looks even more like a dog. No, maybe a deer. Actually, I'm still saying quadruped, man. Really? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm calling quadruped on this one, folks. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna clearly <laughs> say that uh, Micah is. <laughs> Drinking on St. Patty's Day. And that's okay. You get a pass card because it is St. Patty's Day. I love this video. I do. Um, and here's the here's the other part, Micah, is that we have to go with what um, uh, the video and the eyewitness testimony. Yeah. And, and, you know, what the trucker saw. And and so there you go. And, and, the, and the upper part, again, uh, when I look at it, uh, we're at 59. What's the what's the dollar tally up to? Right now we're looking at sixty dollars for a Starbucks or Amazon gift card. All you have to write in the live chat is alien exactly as you see it here if you're watching this live and only if you are watching this live we'll do the drawing at the very end of the show and i'm not going to say this too many times after that but i will place it in the live chat for you guys to copy and paste yeah everybody in the chat man throw in some dosh a dollar five dollars ten dollars let's make this something special for somebody and we have 180 people watching only 62 entries 63 entries okay you know what we're not even going to do the drawing until we at least get 90 someone today is going to win 60 dollars Okay. Starbucks or Amazon. Cassidy just dropped in 10. Now, see, look, Chris James says you can clearly see feet and legs and shorts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, I totally agree. So, oh, so are we up to 70? We're up to 70 right now. Just put it exactly how you saw it. Cassidy, thank you so much. Now we're at 70 instead of 60, but moving onward very quickly on that video overall i found it really interesting uh, it is hard to say if it is an animal or a ghost or even a trash bag as some people had written in the comments but as jimmy had mentioned we're really leaning on the witness testimony yeah like, you have to that's what combines things together exactly 
So um, there you go. Okay, uh, Micah, are, are you picking what's next? Oh, Christina, who's picking what's next? Micah, go ahead. Take I'm the next pick. Yeah. So we had this fascinating story here about, I believe his name is Peter Mahay or Peter Mahi, uh, but he has essentially become a high school alien tracker. It's kind of like you've heard of, I was a teenage werewolf. This guy became a high school alien tracker, but he's not going out there. <laughs> You know, in the desert, he's not he's not, you know, hanging around the black air uh, or the uh, the black mailbox. He's not poking around out there at the gate to Area 51. No, what Peter has done is he used publicly accessible information, okay, made available uh, as part of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, otherwise known as SETI. And he is partially responsible. I think that there are actually a lot of citizen scientists who have contributed to this, but he is partially responsible uh, for the detection of eight radio signals of interest which have not definitively been attributed to alien civilizations out there, but they could be. Now, Peter points out a lot of things. There was some great uh, nuggets that he provided in an interview. Um, and, and I do want to give a little bit, a, bit of, a little bit of background about Breakthrough Listen, what that is. If you've listened to Jimmy's show, Jimmy's talked about this a lot. Christina, I think you've touched on it. I have on my program, too. This is essentially a project to search for intelligent extraterrestrial communications. We aren't just looking for any kind of aliens. We're looking for essentially techno signatures and maybe intentional attempts at communication by intelligent alien civilizations that at least have technologies and technological capabilities comparable to our own. They have about $100 million in funding. They've also got thousands of hours of dedicated telescope time, and they've got some of the most state-of-the-art facilities that are currently in use that are all in this effort. And it all together comprises the most comprehensive search for alien communications really that's ever existed and, and that is currently in use. So this is an interesting one, again, because, you know, it, it just goes to show that people out there at home with little more than a computer and a will to learn can get involved. Peter started contacting uh, some of the folks, I think, at uh, Berkeley, right? Uh, he had uh, contacted their SETI lab. He began asking questions about the data. They were so impressed with the fact that a high school kid was interested in trying to learn about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence that they offered him a summer job, right? Jimmy, this would have been like a dream for you or I when we were in high school. Uh, man, man, man. You know, you read this article and it just, you know, it. it I would love to be that guy. And the other thing is, you know what I'm reminded of, Mike, if you go back to when you were 17, 18 years old, what had you done with your life up to that point? Right? <laughs> you know, oh, you know I mean, I've mean? only written three or four books and then, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and just think about that. His, his, he wrote the paper, right? Okay. That was a peer reviewed. That was number one. Um, that's a pretty gnarly accomplishment for anybody to to do in a lifetime. But number two, his, his his comments and the way that he speaks about it, where okay, so we modify the algorithm. We're going to go ahead and modify another algorithm. We're going to do this. We need to go for billions of stars instead of. And, and then he pointed this out. They've they discovered eight signals that all of the professional radio astronomers in the world haven't found. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. He found it, and he did that with 1,000 stars. Yeah. That's all and he here's did. The other thing. Yeah. Here's the other thing the well, part of what's sure. so significant, too, about this, Jimmy, is that as Peter is showing, this is putting artificial intelligence to use intelligently. I mean, everybody's talking about chat GPT and all of these different forms of AI that really – if you have been following this story like we have been, and I certainly keep up with this almost daily, you know, I'm not so sure that AI is yet to the point where it is truly intelligent unless it is used in the proper ways. For instance, get on chat GPT and you ask it questions. You may get an accurate response, but often these AI uh, software programs that are, you know, text generation programs that rely on algorithms, they are made to sound smart and authoritative even when they are not, and they are not always been shown to provide accurate information. Uh, in this instance, however, probing the universe for extraterrestrial intelligence by using uh, data that's been collected in massive quantities that really even a team of humans, a large one at that, having to try and pour through all that, and then factoring in human error and things like this, I mean, it would be a monumental task. And then even then, you can't really necessarily be certain that your interpretation of that data is 100% solid. Here is a great example of using AI intelligently and having that assistive algorithm 
sort through that data more quickly for you. And then when it gives you these key points, here are the eight signals that we found of interest. Then humans can go back, look at it and say, aha, now this is interesting. And again, that saves time. It enhances the search effort. And in likelihood, this is my prediction, Jimmy and Christina, I think in the years ahead, really continued use of AI will, I think, enhance the effort and probably help us close in on the eventual discovery of ET out there, unless they turn up right in our backyard. Now, I got to ask you guys both. Did you read the paper that was recently published by Avi Loeb and Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of the Aldermain Anomaly Resolution Office? I did. I read it all. I spoke to Avi about it, of course, and yep. and uh, a couple of uh, his people um, uh, directly about it. So what's your question? Yeah. So, uh, Christina, have you read the paper? I read bits and pieces. I did. I did not read the entire thing. You know, one thing I'll point out about this paper is, and in, in essence, for anybody who hasn't read this, uh, what Avi and Dr. Kirkpatrick are trying to do is they are trying to say, look, here are some hypothetical means by which an extraterrestrial intelligent civilization might send probes that could even enter our solar system. And here's how they might disperse them throughout the solar system. Here's how we might eventually find evidence of extraterrestrial gadgets. When I read the paper, I thought, this is about 90% Avi Loeb. And again, just like you, Jimmy, I contacted Avi that same day and spoke with him the very next morning. And I, I was more interested about that paper uh, in terms of the authorship. I was more interested in asking Avi, you know, what led to you and Sean Kirkpatrick co-authoring this, this study, which essentially is saying, here are things we might look for uh, if and how we might be uh, propose that they would behave or appear, optical emissions, radio frequencies, if they are highly maneuverable, fast-moving UFOs or UAPs, uh, as many in the military claim that they've encountered. The reason I bring that up in the context of Peter and his uh, assistance with this Breakthrough Listen project and the detection of these algorithms is that traditionally most astronomers, like Avi Loeb and others, they are doing the SETI side of things. And Avi's always saying, Jimmy, I know he's told you this too. He's always saying, I get so much pushback from the SETI people who think that what I'm doing right now, saying, here's what we might be able to see if a UAP were moving very quickly, it's going to produce this friction against the, the uh, atmosphere and that's, that's going to produce an optical emission. We, If we know what things to look for, it might help us enhance the effort to find them. He says, there are people who just act like I'm nuts to propose these things. And he says, let's not forget the SETI people, a few decades ago, they were the fringe ones back then. They were the ones who everybody was saying, this is a waste of time. Why are we putting money right now? It used to be taxpayer dollars. Now it's you know independently funded with the SETI Institute. But why are we putting any money behind the search for ET? We haven't found any. Well, do we know necessarily that just because we hadn't found any up until maybe recently, it wasn't out there? Again, the new study that Peter was involved with, the new uh, detections of these eight signals, Avi's ongoing efforts with the Galileo Project, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick's apparent interest in that, being the guy who's currently leading the DOD's effort to determine what UAP might be. That all comes together to make for one really, really interesting equation for me right now. And again, whether it's found out there or in our backyard, I do think that we probably are going to find extraterrestrial gadgets uh, in the near future. And again, even Seth Shostak saying this, he's like, guys, I'll bet you a cup of coffee that by the end of this decade, we'll find some sort of evidence of something. Well, a cup of coffee isn't really too much to bet. But aside from that, the two names that are Avi Loeb and um, Kirkpatrick, these people with their status, it's so remarkable and it's truly inspiring and shocking at this point in time that they're placing their name on something that would be classified as theoretical. But even so, they're putting themselves out there publicly and stating it's a possibility. Now, looking at Peter and his work uh, regarding this article, hmm. what I found the, the coolest thing about this was... I found it that such a young person was so inspired by this conversation that he reaches out to SETI, right? Because asking questions, it hurts nobody, right? And so this kid who is in high school created an algorithm. He contacts SETI and SETI's like, you are so cool. You're so smart. Come work for us in the summer. And this goes to show that you can literally do anything and nothing's going to stop you but yourself if you 
ask, if you simply ask, the worst thing that's going to happen is that they say no. Now, in this case for Peter, they said yes, and look at him now. He's making a huge name for himself, and it's incredibly exciting. And I would like to state, Jessica, thank you so much for the super sticker and fit boxer as well. If you want to give it directly to the gift card, please let me know in the live chat. Um, otherwise, it's for the channel. So thank you so much either way. But moving onward, because I think this is a, a, a great transition to move over to the article that you wrote, Micah, for the debrief. And this is talking about from the far side of the moon, NASA and the DOE plan to search for signals from the dark ages of the universe. Now, Obviously, that title sounds incredibly enticing. So what can you tell us about this article that you just recently wrote? Well, what we're essentially talking about here is this uh, fascinating experiment, the Lunar Surface Electromagnetics Experiment, uh, NIGHT. That's the actual um, space observatory that NASA, in conjunction with the Department of Energy, they hope to place on the far side of the moon. Uh, but there's also the delivery mechanism, which has a similar name. Um, so not to confuse those two. Uh, what we're looking for, this so-called dark ages of the universe, refers to a period that occurs roughly about 370,000 years after the Big Bang. And um, during this period in our universe, there weren't, there hadn't been enough time really for matter and the material, the star stuff that's, that Carl Sagan always talked about, to come together and actually produce uh, you know, stars and the kinds of things that produce optical emissions, radio frequencies, and other kind of detecta uh, detectable ranges of spectra that we as astronomers on Earth can study today. Uh, and therefore, to try and learn about that period in history is very difficult when you're trying to do that from Earth, because not only are these fairly weak signals, but also we have the opaqueness of Earth's atmosphere, which effectively blocks that. And so this is primarily why we have Hubble and, of course, now the James Webb Space Telescope. We place these space observatories out there beyond Earth's atmosphere in orbit because that actually enhances our capabilities to be able to see. But what they're hoping to try and do is take that even one step further by placing a space observatory on the far side of the moon, which thereby not only shields this observatory uh, from light from the sun, but also from radio emissions at times when the moon is placed in the right positioning with relation to Earth, it shields it from radio emissions from nearby planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, and that could potentially offer a unique ability to detect this, this kind of this dark age of the universe from some of the earliest periods after the Big Bang that are known. Uh, the question, of course, is whether it can be done in the harsh lunar environment on the far side of the moon. You hear, of course, and I'm a Pink Floyd and music fan in general. So we hear about the dark side of the moon. There isn't really a dark side. There's a far side of the moon that's always facing away from Earth. Uh, and if you see imagery of the far side of the moon, it's far more cratered than the side that faces Earth. And there's an obvious reason why, because again, that's the side that's actually facing out and it's all the space junk and all the debris that's coming toward it. Uh, asteroids, comets, and what have you, they're going to probably, not always, but often land on that side of the moon. So placing an observatory is going to be useful on the far southern moon, but it's also going to be subjected to more potential impacts. It's going to be subjected to the extremities of the hot and then the cold temperatures by night, the lunar night, uh, that the far side of the moon also experiences. So there's some serious challenges with doing this, but if Lucy night actually does get off the ground, they get it up there into position, and if the hardware can withstand the hot temperatures of day and then the coldness of lunar night, this may actually allow us an unforeseen perspective toward this dark age of the universe, something that astronomers have hoped to see for a long time and have as yet been unable to do. Do you have an idea of when this will be launched? I believe that the uh, plan is to by as soon as late 2025, according to the current yeah, timeline. Yeah, then, yeah. It, it, it's, it's scheduled to be delivered um, uh, there in uh, 2025. So yeah, at least yeah, by the end of the year. Yeah. They've, got the, they've got the launch scheduled and the, uh, and the rocket, uh, the transport vehicle, it's it's all it's all on the schedule. So uh, 2025, you know. It, it, here's the other, you know. Uh, appreciate all of that, Micah. I mean, to just get to the direct part of what Micah was saying, I'll condense it down just a little bit. Um, is is that the challenges are heat and cold? All right. The advantages are uh, very little if any, 
radio interference man-made that comes from the surface of the earth. It's all being blocked by the moon. So you're on the other side of the moon. You're blocking all of that interference out. You're able to scan deeper without uh, clean signals, right? It's like wiping your glasses. So you have that. The challenges of the minus 250 degrees, uh, plus 250 degrees, and those swings um, have been overcome. They know that those are the challenges that they face. You face those same temperature st- swings on the on the moon, side of the moon that's facing us, right? So we are used to that. We know that uh, these are what we have to go through. That includes um, our astronauts that are on the face of the moon. You go and you stand in, in sunlight, and then you go stand in shadow, take a step into shadow, you're having a huge swing in temperature with your spacesuit. So you're you're going from air conditioning to heat very, very quickly. These are the challenges uh, that we know that we're facing on that side of the moon, and I think that Lucy is ready to go. Um, it is, uh, it's finished. It's in a testing phase now. That's it. They're going to load that thing up on a rocket. They're going to land it on the dark side of the moon and 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 start scanning. I, I think this is a great, fun, and exciting thing to do. It's also, uh, compared to the challenges that we have here on Earth, it's actually pretty economical. It's an economical. Oh, we, have to, we have to build things a lot bigger here to get the same results. Okay? We're talking like Arecibo large. And you're able to um, break this down and make it a lot smaller, and it's a lot more efficient. So uh, it, it, this is this is big news, and I'm very excited about it. And Absolutely. if you're enjoying what Micah and Jimmy are saying, all of their social media links are in the description box below. Jimmy does have a YouTube. Micah has a YouTube, but he doesn't post videos, but you can find him on his podcast, the Micah Hanks program. But, Micah, we got we got to get you on on youtube um there was one question here from mr mh question for jimmy do you think the moon is artificial or natural and we did an entire show Mm -hmm. about the moon Mm -hmm. jimmy and i uh well like last year but answer the question artificial or natural in your opinion i i obviously i think uh anybody that is is rational and studies things um would say of course it's not artificial right and, and, and but then that's closing my mind down, right? You have to just kind of look at some other things. Um, but when you when you start going off check marks, uh, the, the evidence of something like that being artificial, the, the that evidence supports it being artificial. But it's always to the extreme of being on the outside of the box. Um, but I'll tell you this, I wouldn't have an issue if it was artificial. The, the things like it rings like a bell, right? It's been recorded to be hollow. Um, there's been recordings of that. Um, the the odds of something uh, being formed uh, that orbits the Earth for tidal lock, uh, for time of day, uh, distance from the sun, uh, without the moon, there would be no life here on Earth. All of these things, the odds of it being in the perfect spot at the right time, uh, right place uh, throughout history and everything else is is why we are here. So is th- does that support, you know, what are the odds of that? Now, let's let's swing this in another direction, and then we'll move on. We are looking for exoplanets out there. That are in the Goldilocks zone. All right. Okay. And we're we're coming up with some pretty incredible numbers. But I would say one of the arguments for somebody like a Neil deGrasse Tyson or even a Micah Hanks, you know, some of the big brains out there that will counter that and say, well, you know, that's not good enough. A planet in the Goldilocks zone isn't necessarily going to be the the magic combination that makes some kind of soup uh, to create DNA. You would need an artificial moon on, that is orbiting that planet for the other things. You know, the, the tidal, the gravity um, that happens when the tides recede um, every eight hours, right? They go back and forth every four hours uh, up and down. 
uh, that mix that's stirring the pot that's stirring the soup it's not getting stagnant and it's that kind of motion that is created by the moon all right so you would need that in uh in another solar system with another planet for the best chances of life being out there now that being said that to me kind of supports the artificial moon <laughs> hypothesis, right? That maybe somebody towed that thing here and, and put it there to make sure that we had the right magical combinations of everything for a very long time to, to keep things going on this planet. So, um, and then go watch, uh, what was that movie? Uh, what was the Roland Emmerich film? Uh, the moon film that came out two years ago. Moonfall? Hmm. Moonfall. Go watch Moonfall. Yeah, love that movie, and you just never know. So there you go. That's my long-winded answer. I I can go either way. I I enjoyed the analogy of the soup, but Micah, let's let's give this question over to you before we continue. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, again, I'm naturally going to lean toward the likelihood of the moon being a natural satellite. Uh, The question over its mysterious origins... I mean, that's that's still a really good question. There's also the uh, notion that rather than being um, some sort of a hunk of space debris that, you know, entered an orbit around Earth, that perhaps there was a collision long ago and that a piece of Earth broke off and that that's actually what the moon is long, long ago. And of course, after remaining in orbit for so long, it's over time been shaped into the, you know, roughly globular shape i mean even the earth isn't a perfect globe a perfect sphere uh, by any stretch of the imagination it's it's quite misshapen when you actually look at it but all that said uh jimmy makes some really good points and this has always fascinated me um it could be that one element that is missing in the equation often when we talk about the search for extraterrestrial life and again this not just being uh intelligent life like what peter mahay and others have been searching for in terms of techno signatures when it comes to any kind of life and to find those we would look for something called bio signatures evidence even that simple life forms might actually um produce uh, through perhaps methane emissions right if they are really fo- uh, fond of fiber or whatever on their planet uh, or if there's something else that they produce that is detectable and that we might be able to place an like a a probe in orbit around one of those planets and detect these biosignatures. Um, It is conceivable that a requirement for life to develop on a planet could be the presence of a moon. That and maybe other things like water, the soup that Jimmy's talking about, right? You got to have soup in the bowl before you can stir it and you can create that life. But again, it very well may be that a combination of those chemical ingredients and of course the water in which we presume life probably first takes shape Uh, from those building blocks, amino acids and things like that, which also may have extraterrestrial origins. Numerous studies now are suggestive of this. And then finally, also the presence of a natural satellite and one that is capable of exerting influence on its planet host such that it actually produces the tides and these other kinds of phenomena that are associated, uh, associated with our moon. Yeah, that could be requisite for life. And the search for habitable planets may be more uh, involved or rather it, it, it perhaps should involve more finding planets with moons like ours even as much or more than just finding those planets that are close enough to their star and in that goldilocks zone like you were saying jimmy so that could be the missing piece of the puzzle in my opinion yeah it, it should be another filter that's added that's all it's just another filter when you're when you're scanning and so if you can add that right and you run that uh, filter and so you're in the Goldilocks zone, right? You're at the right temperature. You've got the right, uh, the right star type, all of these things, right? But the, that last filter would be, is there another, it, does it have a moon that can support yeah. the, or remember, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these exoplanets that we find are not spinning. They're locked. They're constantly facing their star. Mm-hmm. So yep. one side is being blasted by radiation and, and right. heat, and the other side has a lack of radiation and a lack of heat. We need radiation to live. We need the right amount of it, right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a balance. And so, you know, every 24 hours, we're constantly shifting and shifting and shifting. And, and again, uh, the moon is keeping our orbit at a certain speed, uh, our, our, our 24-hour cycle. All of these, it's a very magical 
combination of distances and size and mass uh, that that make us just like perfect. It's not necessarily the Goldilocks zone and the distance from the sun. There's a lot of other things uh, that come into look at that. Ken Priest. Ken Priest coming in strong. Ken, I need blueberry biscuits. I ate my last blueberry biscuit this week. I am for his a- birthday, right? Happy yeah. birthday, Ken. Man, man, man. I'm out of biscuits. And you know what? And so I, I went past the blueberry. I'm so excited Ken is here. Uh, I, I, my last cinnamon biscuit was eaten last night. I'm out, bro. I'm out. <laughs> you got my well, Cassidy, thank you so much. And Ken as well for donating to the gift card. Now we're looking at $125. One person is going to win an Amazon or Starbucks gift card. You just got to put the word alien in the live chat. If and only if you are watching this show live, we'll do the drawing in about 30 minutes. So thank you guys so much. You're going to make someone's day. Sorry. But All right. I, 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 I get to pick the next one. No, I get, I get to pick the next one. No, no, you're the host. You right. Get, so it's my you, show. You don't get to pick dessert. You don't. No, no, no. It's okay. always going to be ice cream. <laughs> Go ahead. Go well, ahead. because we're talking about the moon, it's only appropriate to talk about the new spacesuits. Oh, yeah, let's go there. I thought we right. were going to do uh, some time travel stuff. Yeah, oh, let's do the spacesuits. Yeah. Um, um, uh, I, I have, okay. Um, I, don't hand this off to me. No, you can hand it off to me if you want. I'm just not You're keen. You're already up. starting. Have I, have I already started? Okay, hold on for a second. Um, here's the deal. Uh, let me get to the space. I'm not queued up. I'm not queued up. But I did a story on this earlier this week. And before um, I, I can get to uh, the contents of the spacesuit and, and so forth, um, it was uh, 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 Axiom. Uh, a Houston-based company, and this is the deal. They look cool. Yes. They look like Buzz Lightyear, <laughs> right? And now, if, if so, for so, uh, look, we're talking about a complete dome on the top of the head, and I've often thought, uh, I'm sure Micah will agree with me on this, is that one of the things, very claustrophobic idea to only be able to look ahead, right? And you can move your head around, you know, but it's a whole nother aspect. If you've got, well, you can't, we're not owls, right? But to have uh, the full dome on the top of the head is totally cool. It's like, man, we're in space. You know, we're, we, we, we've got all of this events. Why don't we have cool space suits? They can do it on TV, Right. Well, they've done it now, and they look amazing. And also, um, when you look at the the inner and outer uh, cover, there is an outer cover that goes with it. Um, go to the 2023. Go over to the end here, Christina. Right, right there. There it is, right there. Now. Here's the other thing about this spacesuit compared to the Apollo suit, which is over on the left. The new Artemis spacesuit is light, fully mobile. Um, when you look at, um, there's one other thing I, I, I can't forget about this, which is uh, a pretty fascinating uh, point here. But when you watch the Apollo dudes bouncing around on the moon, Right. I think that the only thing that they could move was like their ankles. Right. <laughs> they couldn't walk. They had to bounce with their feet. They couldn't really move the right. You know, they weren't they weren't action figures. They were limited by this heavy, gnarly spacesuit. This is a totally different thing. We're talking about the ability to move your arms, your hands, your fingers, your toes, your knees. And you are fully mobile with full vision. And it better be because this prototype is part of a $1 billion investment. So you better be able to move your fingers, move your ankles, move your neck. Otherwise, what are you going to do with all that money? Here's the, and here is the fascinating part about this. All right. Micah, you may not know. I don't know if you know, Christina, they're not selling these. They are renting these to NASA. This is a, a tuxedo rental. 
<laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, you know, I, I read the full spec. I read the task form and, and what, you know, because what you do before you enter in the contract, they give you a task. Right. And they fund you for that. And then you go and then and then you you enter into the contract agreement later. Well, Artemis designed the suit that won. OK, great. Fantastic. But then they said, you have to rent it from us. We own these. You must return them after the wedding. So, yeah, yeah. I thought that that was pretty interesting. So Artemis is definitely going to make some money on these. Um, but I think they look fantastic. They're fully mobile, and that doesn't look constricting to me, and it doesn't feel as claustrophobic as, you know, the uh, – think about the Mercury and the Gemini. Uh, look at Gemini right there. Gemini, that is a claustrophobic uh, space suit. I just – I could never wear that. Um, so there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about this. What did you think when you saw them, Micah? Well, I mean, first of all, yeah, stylistically, I realize, and this timeline helps illustrate that uh, in the past, obviously, spacesuits were not necessarily made with fashion in mind, and, and that makes sense. It's functionality. These are practical designs. Uh, there are reasons why they usually use lighter coloration, uh, and this one of those, of course, being the fact that when you're working out there in the daylight on the moon, as we already covered, you're going to be exposed to a tremendous amount of heat, and therefore the reflectivity or the albedo, right, of a lighter color is going to reflect more light and heat, not absorb it. Now, that is one concern I have about these new spacesuits, but they're probably no, also let designed. Me jump in. Let me jump in. They, they, they have to, there's an outer covering that's white. So, ah, okay. yeah, yeah. So that, that's it's real thin, right? But it's just a reflective layer. So if you're going to be out during the day, you're going to be in sunlight, you're going to just slip that on. And then if you're going to be out at night, you're going to wear the dark colored one um, or if you're going to be mixing between the two. So, no, that's yeah. already thought through. Oh, but back to your fashion design. Now that I've interrupted, I'll just continue. They used uh, the costume designer from Hollywood to design the look of this suit. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, you know, again, I like the look of the suit. It does have an updated appearance. Keeping in mind, of course, temper temperature regulation internally is also going to be something that's going to be happening here. Something else that's very important that you got to take into consideration is the regolith. Uh, in other words, just the soil on the lunar surface, which does not erode the same way that soil here on Earth does, given the conditions on the moon. Again, there's a much thinner atmosphere. There is one. There's barely one. It's much thinner than the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but regolith often can have, even if it's microscopic particulate, it can tend to have jagged exteriors. And something that they've found in the past with uh, space suits and other you know, features of space missions, uh, including the actual spacecraft we've landed on the moon, is that that regolith can work its way into seams and begin to actually break apart and potentially damage suits. So you don't want, for instance, a leak in your space suit. And with in, with designs from over the years, and especially with some of these new ones, these are also things that have to be taken into consideration. It's not just temperature. It's the fact that essentially everything on the moon, even though there's no life forms present, it's presenting a new kind of challenge. And all those things have to be taken into consideration when they're designing a suit like this. So from the looks of it, not only is it more aesthetically appealing to the eye, I think it's probably going to be as or more functional probably than any of these past uh, examples of uh, high-tech pajamas we're looking at here. Yeah, and so uh, let me jump in. Last week, uh, they addressed your concerns, Micah. Mm -hmm. They tested the new uh, Accent spacesuits on Barbie dolls. I'm not oh, making this up. That's right. Great. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, and they have a compressed nitrogen uh, uh, system. Mm -hmm. that sprays the suits down and absolutely 99.9% .9 removal of moon dust from any part of the spacesuit. Now, and, but here's the, the other wow. part. But I, I didn't know this. Do you know how they removed moon dust on the Apollo missions? Here's a, here's a question for you. Don't Google it. I'm, I, I'm, I'll put your hands in the air. I don't want to see you Googling. Okay. Do you know how they did this in the, uh, on no. Apollo? You ready? You tell us. A lint brush. 
Nice. Right, electrostatics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it didn't work. Really? You know, they tried, in other words. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, they, they went high tech and they did it with Barbie dolls. And um, it was... Uh, it was a pretty interesting press release and the way that they uh, dealt with it, but they are, they're one step ahead and that this system will be used on the Artemis missions. So we've got yeah. the new spacesuits and we've got the new cleaning process. Um, and moon dust is a big deal. I it mean, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a, that's a really, really big deal. Um, it's two things. It's glassy, it cuts, and it's also, mm-hmm. um, uh, like talcum powder, soft, okay. it, it, you know, so it can get, not only is it gnarly, but yeah, it yeah. gets into things yeah. and then gets gnarly. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Uh, there you go. Man, what a great show. What's well, that? We're not, we're not done just yet. No, Hold not. on, back it up. Talking about the helmets, they also come with HD video cameras to allow videos from the moon to be watched in high definition back on Earth. I think that because we are in 2023 and we're just only progressing as we go along with our technology that only seems appropriate for these new space suits space suits which once again is a part of a 1 billion dollar budget do we need that much money to make a space suit i don't know i am not a creator for like- these suits but it is it's it's in a it's an insane amount they've been working on these suits for a very very long time and they're only now seeing the progress that publicly we are also seeing as well but this information has kind of been on the down low for quite a few years which which would only make sense like why are you going to tell people so far ahead hey i'm working on this i don't know if it's going to work but uh we're we're going to we're going to find out Yes, they've gotten a lot of funding. This was created by Axiom Space. Um, but we're just, once again, we're just really receiving the pictures of these uh, new suits that kind of just came to the mainstream like early this week. Yeah. Which is really absolutely. cool. Very cool. Yeah, not everybody all at once. Come on now. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm trying to hold back. I've got things I want to say. Okay, before we go on to the next article, I did want to jump back, though. Uh, my mind is always working. Um, I want to just be, f- I, I don't want this to escape everybody. Uh, we were talking about Kirkpatrick and, and Avi Loeb and that paper that they wrote and published, and it did cause quite a stir. Um, and And I understand most people's points with this. But I think that we're losing sight of something. And so we need to go back and center ourselves again. It's not what they wrote about distribution and motherships and, and, and the detectability and, and that these probes are on the other side of James West, uh, 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 um, um, and the, um, the, how do I want to say this? Uh, that they're getting here and they're not being detected properly by the time they get to the James Webb, I should say, uh, Mick West, the James West <laughs> Space Telescope, the Mick West uh, Space Telescope. Um, no, that's not the point. We've lost sight of all of this. The point is, why did they say that? Avi doesn't speak unless there is something there to base something on. Kirkpatrick is not going to say something like that unless there is something to back up these kinds of statements. So I would suggest that although they're not going to say anything right now, that they know what they're talking about. So you have to go back and ask, why did they say that? Why would they put something so controversial that would allow the media to go, alien motherships are distributing probes to planet Earth, Harvard physicists said today. You can't do that. So in order for Avi and Kirkpatrick to make such an extraordinary uh, claim in theory and hypothesis and throw that out there, they're saying it for a reason. It's based on something. What is it that they know? All right. Now, let's circle back. Do I get to pick the next subject? Go for it. Hold on. 
Now, hold on. Hold on. We got to oh, touch on Micah's that. It is Micah's turn. Well, no, I don't mind. You guys can pick the next story, but I just want to touch on what Jimmy's uh, talking about because, frankly, I do think that this is an important story. I also think that the way that the media has reported on this has been absurd in a lot of ways. I saw one headline the other day that said, Official government report warns alien mothership might yeah, be out yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. I saw I'm thinking, no, no, no. This, yeah, this was no government report, no official government report. That's nonsense. This was a Harvard astronomer writing a science paper, which, by the way, when it was published, it had not undergone peer review at that time. It was a preprint, essentially, but it was co-authored uh, with Sean Kirkpatrick. Now, to, to your point, though, Jimmy, and I think you're spot on with this. What I came away from that wondering, and that was the question I had for Avi when he and I spoke, I said, now, Dr. Loeb, am I to infer from the fact that Sean came to visit you, you guys said, hey, maybe we should write a paper about this. And you're addressing what kinds of things one might look for if we were to presume that highly maneuverable, and that term, of course, is used in the paper right there in the actual thesis statement at the beginning, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the idea that highly maneuverable UAP are going to have to obey by the same laws of physics uh, as anything else. And therefore, here are some things we should maybe look for. Again, I came away from that asking, this in itself, by the way, is not necessarily proof of otherworldly UAP or necessarily indicative that Dr. Kirkpatrick has seen something interesting that causes him to think that uh, he needs to make a statement about this. Um, but again, I, I do have to assume that the fact that he's willing to engage with the topic theoretically with Avi Loeb indicates that he is working on the presumption that there is a possibility we might see things like this and that we want to enhance our ability to see these kinds of things. Now, Avi was very clear in saying, uh, I didn't see any kind of classified information. I didn't uh, have to sign any NDAs. Um, Dr. Kirkpatrick knows this. Avi's famous quote is, the skies aren't classified. But it is mm -hmm. interesting. And like you're saying, Jimmy, Here's a guy who says, I wasn't showing any kind of stuff. I am a scientist. I know physics and astronomy, and here's what I think we need to look for based on what physics and astronomy and mathematics tells us. But here's this guy who we have to presume, by virtue of his position at the DOD, okay, as director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, based on the ODNI's report from earlier this year, which actually had to do with something that was supposed to come out last year, but it was late on arrival, it's saying that, look, a lot of these things, balloon or balloon-like entities, like the ones that were shot down recently, right, UAV-like aircraft or objects, but there are still some that we can't characterize easily. Some appear to show technology and sometimes even advanced capabilities that are difficult for us to explain. It seems evident that Dr. Kirkpatrick has been made privy to at least the best data we have collected on those objects that they're describing in that report. And the fact that he co-authors a paper with Avi Loeb saying those kinds of objects might display these characteristics to me is huge. Yeah, it's theoretical, but it is huge knowing what he probably knows about this subject. So to your point, Jimmy, yeah, that is, I think, the premise upon which we have to examine the paper. Here's what these guys collectively bring to the table. One of them having seen the best stuff the government has, and they're now saying, we're going to write a science paper about this. They didn't say, hey, here's a theory. What if there were, no, they're probably saying, look, Here's what we need to look for in terms of what we in likelihood are seeing and what military personnel have said that they've encountered. That to me is huge. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's, it, it, yes. And I, I break it down in, in somebody like me in my terms, right? So collectively all the points that Mike had just made, right? It boils down to just step back and ask why. Yeah. Why? What? 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 Why are you say you don't say things like this without some substance driving your thought, right? So what? Wh why? You know, and we're not, uh, Micah. You and I would never, uh, and, and most people on this planet are not able to break down algorithms or a theoretical physicist or an astrophysicist's head. We don't have that ability. We're, 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 we're not there. But they think, and they are able to process this and look at the math, look at the data, process the data. They have access to uh, equipment and a team around them, right, where they look at this, they collect the data, they put it together, they run the numbers, and they look at and they come to a theory, an idea, a, a hypothesis, a probability. And they look at that and then they turn around and process that for us. And the way that they process it uh, this time around in this paper so we can understand what they are thinking and what they know is that, hey, 
uh, probes are getting here. We're not necessarily detecting them. This is why they are not being detected. And they may be distributed by something larger. All right. And so why? Why would you say that? Why would you say that? It's not because he just watched some science fiction movie. <laughs> it's not. That's not why. It's not because he just got off the phone with me and and I'm talking crazy talk. No, it's the question is why. What what is it that allowed him to freely describe it to us? So there you go. And I'm I'm very curious. Yeah, lots to think I about. Can't say, I can't say any more than that. It's just why would he do it? Now. They aren't the type of people to just wing something, just to write something down Not because they feel like it. Not at all. In this funding environment, you are not going to do that. No, and that's, and that's a really good point and something that Avi has mentioned in his previous interviews when he was doing like 10 a day. Mm -hmm. In order to get funding, you need people to agree with your idea and only the courageous few will go outside of the box and not worry too much about funding, but go what they're actually curious about and then worry about funding afterward. But, but the majority of scientists and researchers, they're going to research things that they know will get funding. Now, in the conversations that we're having today, the UFO topic is becoming a lot more enticing, a lot more intriguing, more very public people are coming out about this, showing their interest in it. So funding now is easier than what it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. So it is a really good point, Jimmy, that you made talking about funding in this environment that we're in today. And for him and Kirkpatrick to write that paper. And the reason, once again, is why. What was the purpose? Because it wasn't on a, on a whim. They didn't do it just for fun. Well, uh, Micah brought up, uh, well, I brought up, Micah uh, uh, went back and, and, and very elegantly uh, spoke about this. That's the way that the media portrayed this and, and turned it into clickbait and their headlines, right? Alien motherships. You know, <laughs> they want to paint the Independence Day scenario so for the clicks. But correctly interpreted, you can read the paper that way. But how does that affect funding? You don't want your funding partners and whatever, it just doesn't matter, National Science Foundation, you know, whatever it is, your partners to go, come at you and go, dude, alien motherships, really? Is this, is this what you want to get? I, I think we really need to think about uh, what we're going to be doing in 2024, man. You, you just can't. See, that's my point. So for for this to happen that way, why? Because he felt that uh, the, the data says to him that this is the direction that he needs to go in, and he's firmly comfortable with that. You know, so why? You know, and and in this funding environment, if you're going to turn around and do something like that, that gives the media the opportunity to create those headlines. You got to back it up. So there's something there, and we don't necessarily uh, have to know that, but just just feel comfortable that uh, Avi and Kirkpatrick are comfortable with it, and that's Look, a really big deal. Bottom line, and I know we're short on time here. I got a gig I've got to get to, ladies and gents. Right? Okay, and lots of shamrocks to pick, and uh, you know, hopefully, maybe a Guinness in my future on this fine St. Patty's Day. But the bottom line about this, Avi is a proponent of finding UAP. He's happy if at the end of the day they train their telescopes and they get their megapixel images and video that he hopes to try and obtain with the Galileo project. He's happy to report to the government if he sees made in China or made in Russia, as he has said. But Avi is looking for the possibility that there may be something more exotic. And if he is open to that possibility and actively searching for them, uh, and if Dr. Kirkpatrick found that to be a useless effort or was someone who was not inclined to think that we are likely to discover anything potentially novel or ex you know, exotic even, uh, let alone a technological device from someplace else like Avi is searching for, I would find it very hard to imagine that Dr. Kirkpatrick would reach out to Avi Loeb and say, let's 
collaborate on a paper together, which is exactly what they did. So again, even though Dr. Kirkpatrick and his position in government, what little he has said, you know, a briefing that occurred late last year, he had actually spoken to the press and said, look, I got to be a scientist. I'm going to look at this through the scientific method, but I'm open to all possibilities, but it's going to be rational. It's going to be scientific what we do. The fact that he's also working with a person who is far more outspoken and even, I think, at times hopeful about the prospects of the detection of something extraordinary in the search for UAP, valid UAP, like Avi Loeb is undertaking with the Galileo Project, that says something. Well, it does. And if you, if, if, uh, I'm sure you've read his book, Extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got a new one coming out later this year, too. Yes, Interstellar. He yes, he does. Yes, he does. And so uh, um, um, when you read Extraterrestrial, Mm-hmm. Um, it's that isn't a book hypothesizing something. That's not what that book is about. That book says Oumuamua was ET, mm-hmm. and he, that that that's, that's the title of the book. And he goes through point for point in that book in depth. If you go and you read that book, there are some extraordinary facts, extraordinary amounts of data that Avi went and looked at and said, this is why Oumuamua was artificial. It was not natural, and it was interstellar, period. So it's not that Avi is hopeful about the, Avi is saying this is what is happening. Not I'm, I'm, I'm out there searching for something. And somebody said, no, they, they, oh. he, True, but he is searching right now with the Galileo Project. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the mindset Avi's coming from. Avi says, we've already had an interstellar extraterrestrial vehicle visit this planet. What else is here? That's Avi's point. And he, that, that's it. That, that's it. He doesn't have another mindset with this, uh, Micah. No, no, no. There, is, there isn't an alternative view from from Avi Loeb and uh, I not only um, uh, have I sat next to him and looked in his eyeballs in person and discussed these subjects with him he is passionate and and he's a singular individual from academia we're talking about Harvard we're talking about the director of the Black Hole Institute right this is a very very serious guy a very brilliant individual and and he understands data that at a level I just said this before that none of us can comprehend. Not none of us. None of us. Forget it. You're not at that level. You know, Avi is a different guy, and and this is what he knows. It's not what he believes. Belief, belief, and believing in something is religious. This is fact. This is a pragmatic, fact-based, data-driven position that he is in, and so that's it. And and that's that's Avi Loeb, man. So that's why why would he write this paper? That's the question. And what a great way to end today's show and to get started with this drawing. You have a few moments left to put Alien in the live chat, if and only if you are watching this live. We have 250 people watching. We have 111 entries. One person will be able to win a $125 Amazon or Starbucks gift card. What? While we started off at $10, it went all the way up to $125. So thank you for everyone that donated to that and to make someone's day. Also, before we even do the drawing, hit the hit the thumbs up button. If you enjoyed today's show, hit the like button. All right, because that shows me and our, our beautiful guests right here, our co-hosts that you enjoyed today's show. So if you're going to even put Alien for, for today's entry, you're going to have to like the video first. Got to do both. <laughs> well said. Well said. Hey, hey, uh, uh, Micah and uh, Christina, uh, just thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to come in here and just just get my mind out there. I don't I don't speak enough. You know, all I do is ask questions. I never get my my opinion or thoughts out and, and to, to come in here uh, with the two of you and, and do this uh, as often as we do. It's just an honor and a privilege. And thank you for putting up with me. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Micah behave. Where are you going? We're not leaving. Just here. We're going to do the drawing with you right here. 
Oh, you you can't you can't just run. But okay. Jimmy, we always enjoy hearing what you have to say. It's always a pleasure, and I truly love these monthly roundtables. I love how you've been doing them consistently every single month. I know that people that are watching and listening also really enjoy these as well. So I want to say thank you, Jimmy and Micah, for doing this and sticking with me every single month. Let's let's do this drawing. You guys ready? Should, should we do a countdown or just, how do we just do, do it? it? How do we do it? You just gotta watch while I do the drawing. Oh, okay. All, All right. right, I'm, I'm okay. gonna give everyone five seconds to put the word alien exactly as you see it here, exactly as you see it here. Put it in the live chat if and only if you are watching this live. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. We're doing the drawing right now. Oh, this is cool. Strange Lunatic, congratulations. Wow, you just won $125 for an Amazon or Starbucks gift card. What, you, kind, of, what kind of black magic is this? Uh, it's StreamYard. Now, for those that didn't see their name, I guarantee your name was in the entry, but it was so many names on there that it couldn't have gone through all of them in that short time frame. But if you wrote the term, or the word alien in the live chat, you were a part of the entry. Deranged Lunatic, please send me an email with your YouTube URL. And if you would like a Starbucks or Amazon gift card, my email is in the description box below. As soon as you send that over to me, I'll get that prize sent over to you. And Wow, I was so cool. <laughs> I'm glad I stayed. <laughs> and I, I simply could not have done today's show without you guys. You really inspired so many people to make Deranged Lunatics Day today to win such an awesome prize. Um, Micah, where can people find you online? I'm easy to find. MicahHanks.com and TheDebrief.org. And those links are below. Jimmy, what about yourself? You can find me. At goldtop.com. Find me at goldtop.com. <laughs> you guys Only have a great night. You have a great night, Mike. I'll send you, I'll send this to you. Oh, my uh, brother. See, yeah, yeah. he loves me so much. I love you too, Jimmy. Love both you guys. The fam. It's always great to be here. I'll talk to you guys. Thanks, everybody you guys. have a great, safe, fun, amazing weekend. And I'll see everybody on Monday. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. All right. What an awesome show today. Out of all the articles that we covered, which one was your favorite? Please let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments as well. Deranged Lunatic, please send me that email. My email is below with your URL. And if you would like a Starbucks or Amazon gift card. All right. Um, also, if you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord server. That link is also below where you can speak with 1,500 other like-minded members on everything, including your insights, your opinions, your thoughts, and your experiences. It's a very safe and friendly place to do all of that and more. Also, if you need help falling asleep, relaxing, meditating, check out my music channel at Cosmic Portals. That link is also below. We are so close to a thousand subscribers. And this last track, Waterworld, when I was doing the edits, I fell asleep several times. So like, you know, it's good if the editor fell asleep, right? And also, uh, please share the link to the 24-7 stream to newbies that are new to the UFO topic. All right. You can find that link right here on this channel. And uh, Cassidy, thank you so much for sharing that Discord link as well. Deranged Lunatic, congratulations. I am so happy for you, my friend. That is really, really awesome. Also, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies. There you can find all of my updates and news. That is eyes underscore on the skies right on Twitter. That is it for today. I will see you next time. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.